If you're coming from my original Quake lore breakdown video or clicked on this with the logical preconceived notion that the following Quake games continue the narrative of the original, I'm here to tell you, they don't. At least not at first. On the surface, Quake Wars enemy territory, Quake 2, and Quake 4 are almost completely separate from the first game. You don't play as the protagonist from Quake, the Ranger, and for the most part, you don't fight any of the same monsters. The new narrative is seemingly set in the same universe, but farther into the future. There's no mention of the conflict from the first game, but there are still a few interesting connections. Unfortunately, not only do you not play as the Ranger, but he isn't present at all, and his whereabouts are not revealed in any capacity. The first Quake took place around the same time it released the 1990s. This new conflict begins in 2065, roughly 70 years later. This leaves plenty of time for the events of the first game to be covered up, or otherwise not referenced during what follows. It's also worth mentioning that the events of Quake were relatively self-contained. The Ranger never ventured too far beyond several military facilities or the strange dimensions of Shabnigaroth, the main villain of the original title. These events, though cataclysmic in their own right and potentially devastating had the Ranger not succeeded, didn't affect humanity on a large scale. With that in mind, it's quite likely that whatever happened during the original Quake is largely unknown by the vast majority of people, and this could explain why its events are seemingly ignored after. The story of the series following the events of the original undergoes a complete tonal shift and introduces tons of brand new enemies. Despite that, there are still narrative connections between the two storylines, but we'll get to those when we encounter them. From this point forward, the monsters of the series almost entirely consist of an alien organization known as the Strog. These strange cybernetic beings had randomly appeared one day in the form of a signal originating from beyond the asteroid belt of the Sol system. Not long after, several bases on Mars were cut off from communicating with the rest of humanity, and shortly after that, human-made space stations were being destroyed. These alien visitors were hostile, attacking Earth with extreme violence and brutality. They were conquerors, traveling through the universe and forcibly assimilating planets and species into their number. For hundreds of years, they marched across the galaxy, seemingly uncontested, until they discovered an insignificant little blue planet whose inhabitants called it Earth. They had defeated entire empires and likely successfully assimilated many different species. Humanity was next in a long line, a wellspring of new flesh to fuel their war machine, and in some instances, their bodies too. Many people were converted into Stroyant, a vile substance that the Strog used as a food source or a source of aid. Others were tortured and subjected to acts so heinous that their minds would completely deteriorate. Believe it or not, they were the lucky ones. The unlucky individuals would be strogified, a violent surgical and mental procedure that involved cutting someone open, swapping some of their body parts with mechanical replacements, and thereby forcing their now twisted forms into being grunts for the alien's army. Humanity fought hard against these invaders, but their technology and ability to convert others into unwilling soldiers made winning a seemingly impossible task. Many battles were fought on Earth between the Strog and the GDF, or Global Defense Force, spreading across its entire surface. Even when a Strog soldier died, swarms of small machines would swoop in to collect and repair the fallen soldiers for reprocessing. How quickly this procedure took place is unclear, but this meant that it was quite likely that veteran marines may have killed the same Strog multiple times, or at least a Strog containing some of the same tissues a previous of their number had once possessed. At an undisclosed point, the Strog had managed to build slip gates, portals that allowed them to travel great distances instantaneously in various locations on humanity's homeworld. Information regarding the very first of these portals was strangely important to the aliens, but it's unclear why. These gateways come in various sizes, some large enough to transport massive ships, others that are smaller and used to facilitate transportation of ground troops and vehicles from one side of a planet to another. If you've seen my Quake 1 breakdown, which you should absolutely go watch right now if you haven't, the term slipgate probably sounds very familiar to you. These are the gateways that were used to enter and exit the areas containing Shub Nigaroth's many monsters. Though Strog slipgate designs are very different from the portal seen in the first Quake, their function is the same. The strangest aspect of the Strog gateways, however, was that humanity wasn't even sure that they'd created them, at least not entirely. It was possible they'd simply discovered the technology or reverse engineered it. Regardless of who had created the portals, the Strog had made great use of them throughout their wars across the stars. Thanks to these many successful conquests, they had garnered immense armies with which they'd used to overrun humanity. This wasn't their sole strategy, though. They'd also start employing more thoughtful operations, such as poisoning local water supplies with a substance capable of zombifying the local populace, building machines capable of strogifying on humanity's home turf, manufacturing stroyant production plants in human territory, and establishing footholds in key locations on Earth. 
During these many battles, humanity took every chance they could get to attempt to reverse engineer and repurpose Strahd technology. The aliens' highly advanced machines gave them an edge, an edge they'd lose if someone was able to take advantage of them. In an effort to fight back, the Earthlings captured slipgates, forced Strahd ships to crash in an attempt to learn how they were capable of interstellar travel, and made plans to use their own biotech against them. The most promising project was the creation of an EMP weapon that could potentially be capable of disabling the Strahd fleet parked just outside of Earth's atmosphere, effectively halting their invasion. Whether or not this was successful is unclear, but based on what happens in the coming conflicts, I'd say that's very unlikely. Computer updated. Despite their tenacity, humanity was losing, and they needed to come up with an attack strategy fast. Eventually, they were able to formulate a plan, which they dubbed Operation Alien Overlord. The goal of this mission was to use a slipgate to travel to the Strog homeworld of Stragos and initiate a surprise attack on the alien's home turf. Leading the charge was a team consisting of some of Earth's deadliest soldiers, each confined to their own small maneuverable drop pod. These single occupant aircraft were supposedly small enough to evade the radar that kept a watchful eye on the planet's airspace. Once they arrived on the alien's home turf, a coordinated strike would be led on the planet's capital, Cerberon. This city contained key defense, communications, and political powers that needed to be wiped out in order for humanity to potentially win the war against the alien invaders. It was also home to the Black Hole Generator, the device responsible for powering the slip gates parked outside of the Earth's atmosphere. The planet wasn't completely defenseless, though. Guarding it was a giant anti-air weapon, simply dubbed the Big Gun, that would eviscerate any large human invasion force, as well as a deadly laser security grid preventing ground assaults. Both of these would need to be disabled in order for Operation Alien Overlord to be a success. Many of the Strog's malignant machines were powered by a strange blue crystal that they had mined from deep within their planet. If a given crystal was destroyed, whatever it was being used to power would be put out of commission. Once these objectives were accomplished, the next goal would be to find and eliminate the Macron, a warlord that had been chosen to lead the Strog and their armies. By defeating this entity, their forces would lack a primary leader, and as a result, would be unable to formulate cohesive defensive strategies. These Marines weren't going in blind, though. Lots of intel was given to the brave souls who made the journey to Stragos, such as Strog morphologies they might encounter, weapon information, equipment information, and warnings of the planet's harsh environments. One man, a man by the name of Bitterman, had been anxiously awaiting his inevitable drop onto the enemy's territory, and like all of the other soldiers around him, was more than ready to deliver a package of death and destruction to the alien's front doorstep. He climbed into a troop transport, a ship called the Phobos, named after one of Mars' moons, leaving a dusty Texan landscape behind. Before long, he was led into his own personal drop pod. He climbed inside, the door closed behind him, and locked him within. Soon, they'd travel through a slipgate, which would transport him and his fellow drop pod pilots into Stragos' orbit. Once the troop carrier was in position, it launched Bitterman and the other soldiers towards the alien's homeworld. In their coffin-like vehicles, they plummeted down, rapidly descending towards the planet's surface. As they fell, one particularly idiotic and gung-ho soldier piloted his drop pod carelessly and accidentally smashed into Bitterman's vehicle. His pod immediately started to lose control, causing him to veer completely off course. As bad as this initially seemed, it would actually prove to save his life, though. Despite humankind's preparation and the supposed stealthy nature of the operation, the Strog seemed to have predicted humanity's arrival and didn't take their presence too kindly. As Bitterman crashed towards Stragos' surface, his fellow soldiers started falling out of the sky thanks to an EMP weapon which caused their ships to lose power. His little mishap was the only reason he was still alive and the only thing that prevented him from crashing down with the rest of his platoon. His pod propelled downwards at a frightening pace until it finally smashed onto the alien world's surface. He climbed out, armed with nothing but a simple blaster and his trusty tactical compass, a device that would create holographic arrows on the ground to guide him to his current objective. Seemingly the only survivor, it was now solely up to him to complete the lofty goals of Operation Alien Overlord. Immediately upon exiting, Bitterman was attacked by Strog forces, specifically processed humans that had been twisted and used to fight against their own kind. The strangest thing he'd discover, though, were large supply crates adorned with an insignia. The symbol was known to Bitterman as a symbol of the Strog, but to us, it's something a bit more interesting. If you remember, this symbol was present throughout the original conflict involving Shub Nigaroth as well. Bizarrely, it adorned the boxes found throughout the many military-themed levels that the Ranger fought his way through. So what does this mean? If this symbol specifically represents the Strog, an alien force that wouldn't make their way to Earth until long after the events of the Ranger's fight, then how and why did these crates get here? This implies that there's some kind of connection between the Strog and the bizarre creatures seen throughout the events of the first quake. Think about it for a moment. The Grunt and Enforcer enemies employed in Shub Nigaroth's army are extremely similar to the Strog. 
They were humans that had been given implants through surgery. These implants would override their mental faculties and essentially force them to fight for Shub Nigoroth and her cohorts. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? And an awful lot like Strogification. Let's look back to Ranger's fight once more, specifically his most recent confrontation during Dimension of the Machine, released with the 2021 remaster. There's one section of that battle where the Ranger delves into a place called the Realm of Astrologers. While in this strange world, he'd collect an arcane rune, which would be used to power an ancient and strange machine. When he grabbed the object and held it in his hand, it filled his mind with information. He suddenly became aware that this particular rune was being hunted down by some of Shub Nigoroth's minions. This world, the location of the rune he sought, had been a attacked by those entities. An attack originating not from a slipgate, but a ship that came from somewhere beyond the stars. In case you've forgotten, let me quickly remind you that each time the ranger came in contact with these beasts, it was via a slipgate. There was never any mention of something from outer space. According to the information that the ranger gleaned from the rune, the invaders had abducted the planet's inhabitants, but for what purpose is unclear. This all sounds pretty familiar though, doesn't it? randomly appearing from an unspecified region of space, stealing the planet's local population for their own twisted purposes and pilfering the planet of its treasures. Sounds an awful lot like the Strog, doesn't it? It almost seems as though the Ranger had accidentally come into contact with them long before they had made their way to Earth. Perhaps he had unintentionally stopped an invasion by entering the first slipgate and fighting through Shub Nigaroth and her minions, potentially making the full-scale attack that came from space some form of eventual retaliation. Just some food for thought. Bitterman fought his way through the building his pod had crashed in, killed many once human soldiers, and eventually came into contact with another enemy type. These bigger, burlier creatures still appeared to be human, but it's hard to say if they ever truly were. Perhaps these larger enemies were what actual genuine Strog looked like, as in not a being that was converted, but one that existed in that state naturally. When considering the fact that they'd subjugated other civilizations into their number and had a pension for altering their physical appearances in favor of cybernetic enhancements, it's impossible to say for sure. Perhaps the Strog encountered by humanity had been so drastically modified from their original appearance that they'd be completely unrecognizable if we saw them. However, that's assuming a natural Strog even exists. Maybe they're completely synthetic. That would explain why they seem to only recruit more into their number via strogification rather than traditional biological reproductive means. After all, the vast majority of strog variants encountered by humanity outwardly appear to be male, save for a few entities we'll get to later. This begs the question, if we assume the strog are a manufactured race, cobbled together in a Frankenstein fashion, why were they created? And more importantly, who or what is their creator? This line of thinking was far beyond Bitterman, however. After all, he was a simple soldier with a burning hatred for the Strog, and the odds that he possessed any knowledge of the events that took place in the 90s with the Ranger are extremely slim. That was old history at this point. Fighting here and now was more than likely his only concern. His first goal, now that he was on the surface of Stragos, was to re-establish communications with the nearby command ship, the same vessel that delivered him to Stragos in his drop pod. As he pushed through the facility, he would occasionally pass by the bodies of his fallen comrades, which likely saddened him greatly, but in the end, only strengthened his resolve. Broken radio transmissions blasted through his comms device from time to time as well, but with the Strog jamming his ability to contact anyone, they served as nothing but a reminder of why he continued to fight. On his way to restore communications, he came into contact with a new creature. GDF Intel had given these things the appropriate name of Parasite due to their ability to attach themselves to a target and leech away vital fluids. These hideous creatures were yet another example of vile Strog bioengineering, as most of their four-legged bodies was mechanical, save for their heads and the tongue-like tentacle they used to drain away a target's life force. As hideous as the creature was, Bitterman put the beast down with a few rounds from a newly acquired shotgun and pushed forward. Not long after, Bitterman would come into contact with a very strange piece of Strog equipment, the quad damage. Look familiar? That's because it's extremely similar to the design of the quad damage encountered by the Ranger. Coincidence? Perhaps, or maybe it serves as yet another connection to the Strog in Shub Nigoroth's monsters. A lot of the times when Bitterman would kill one of the Strog, the creature would continue to attack him post-mortem. In some instances, their heads would literally pop off, and yet they'd continue firing. According to GDF Intel, this was due to some kind of spasm in their arm, likely akin to the involuntary movements that can occur in Earth-based biologics, even after death. Almost as soon as they went down, their bodies were accosted with what appeared to be flies, as if their skin had already been rotting, and the scent of decay beckoned the insects immediately. Perhaps this implies that these Strog were never alive at all, and that they're only ambulatory thanks to their implanted cybernetics. 
It's also possible that these were swarms of the small bug-like robots I mentioned earlier, sent to repurpose the tissues of the fallen Strog soldiers. Regardless of whatever the case may be, Bitterman finally made it into the comm center and came into contact with another new monster, a gunner. These adversaries were far deadlier than the creatures he'd faced so far and were considered to be one of the Strog's more elite soldiers. These super battle droid looking freaks had a gun mounted to each arm and a less than pleasant disposition. This particular gunner was guarding a console that would allow Bitterman to enable communications with the horse he rode in on. Without a moment's hesitation, Bitterman laid into the creature, quickly putting it down and likely scoffing at the notion that this was somehow one of Stragos' elite. Now that it was dead, he was free to interact with the console, enabling a nearby radar dish and effectively ending his communicative blackout. Immediately after, a blue key card revealed itself to him and he snatched it up. With this key card in hand, Bitterman could push forward, making his way further into enemy territory and gradually closer to his ultimate goal of killing the Macron. On his way out of the comms area, he encountered yet another new beast, a group of enemies that had been labeled Flyers. These small floating creatures were fragile, but when faced in groups, were potentially deadly. Their bodies were primarily composed of a solid metallic aircraft, each side equipped with guns and wings that doubled as knives. Much like other members of the Strog army, a small, bloodied, and organic head was grafted into the center of the aforementioned aircraft's body. Using a fancy new machine gun, Bitterman made short work of them and pushed further into the alien facility. As he marched on, yet another new creature would find its way to Bitterman. This particular Strog configuration was referred to as a berserker, and rightfully so. As soon as it laid eyes on our hero, it yelled the word trespasser and ran at him with astonishing speed. Was this creature actually speaking English? Surely aliens from another world wouldn't use a language from Earth, unless perhaps a small portion of the creature's mind remained intact. Not enough to stop it from attacking Bitterman, but enough to potentially hold onto the language it used to call its own. Either way, it lunged towards him and slammed into the ground, sending a small shockwave rippling towards Bitterman. The sheer force of the air flung him backwards and damaged him a staggering amount. In the end though, this creature, like those that came before it, was no match for the lone soldier. After its cheap shot, he blasted the creature away and continued his march forward. The further he went, the greater the resistance from the Strog forces became. This could only mean one thing. He was moving in the right direction and they wanted to stop him. Even the planet's natural inhabitants were deadly and seemed to want to put an end to Bitterman's mission. Pools of water were occasionally occupied by giant eel-like creatures with mouths full of razor-sharp teeth called Barracuda Shark, but they too would meet their end when faced against the Lone Man. As he pushed through various Strog facilities, he would take the time to destroy a logistics train that ferried supplies to enemy forces, and shortly after, stumble upon another new beast. The Barracuda Shark wasn't the only twisted wildlife that Bitterman would encounter. He'd also battle large quadrupedal animals, simply dubbed mutants. Not only do they bear a striking resemblance to fiends, a breed of monster the ranger faced, but their attack patterns were also extremely similar, utilizing their large claws to rend the flesh of their victims. These poor creatures were once docile, but thanks to the toxic waste expelled from untold years of the use of Strog refineries, they'd completely mutated into violent beasts. He'd also battle gladiators and tanks, which were much larger mech-like warriors with some of the deadliest weapons the Strog could muster. These bigger bipedal enemies look an awful lot like Armagon, the final boss of a portion of the ranger's story, Scourge of Armagon. Is it possible that Armagon had some relation to the Strog? Maybe they just look similar and it's a simple coincidence, but I don't think so. I'm willing to bet that this is yet another connection to the original conflict. What exactly this means, I'm not sure. Perhaps Armagon, seemingly an at least partially manufactured entity, was built by the same thing that made the Strog, potentially making the Rangers battle with Armagon the first ever Strog confrontation with humanity. Bitterman eventually made his way to a prison where the aliens kept several victims, likely some of the survivors from the humans' initial invasion, or potentially collected even before that. These men had been so brutally tortured that their brains were scrambled, driving them to insanity. Freeing them from their holding cells did little to aid their minds. In fact, they didn't even seem capable of understanding when they had been released. This no doubt saddened Bitterman greatly, likely only serving to stoke the embers of hatred he felt for the straw within him. After a while, he'd make his way to a device which was powered by the very same crystal he'd heard about in his mission briefing. This particular crystal was powering the Strog defense grid. Guarding this power source was a giant Strog machination. Without hesitation, it assaulted him. This hideous beast was called a super tank, and for good reason. Its entire body was a mechanical monstrosity, save for its mask-covered head. In place of legs were two massive treads, and instead of arms, it possessed a chain gun and a missile launcher. This deadly opponent could have easily killed Bitterman, but he was far too skilled with his arsenal and using some of the Strog's own weapons against it, he took the beast down. Now that the super tank had fallen, there was nothing standing between him and the crystal being used to power the defense grid. He shot it and it exploded, disabling yet another integral Strog system. 
On his way to his next objective, he traveled through a strong crystal mine and disabled a vile factory used to convert human flesh into Stroyant, the substance the aliens used as nourishment. His next demolition job was to destroy an important reactor, the only objective left before he aimed to take out the big gun. He destroyed it as quickly as he could, and with those goals accomplished, nothing stood between him and the big gun's power systems. Nothing except an ultra heavy level monster called a Hornet. This giant airborne adversary was fast and equipped with a pair of deadly chain guns and rocket launchers. The beast fired everything it had at Bitterman, but it was simply no match for him. After a hard fought battle, it fell leaving only the lone soldier left alive. Now that the guard was dead, Bitterman was able to make his next move and finally disable the big gun. He quickly activated a console within the giant turret and immediately upon its activation, a low rumbling noise filled his ears. A voice spoke through his comms device, warning him that an explosion was imminent and that he needed to evacuate fast. Knowing this, he sprinted towards a strong vehicle and made his escape towards his next objective. With the big gun permanently decommissioned, Bitterman could finally receive some air support. Now that his allies could patrol the skies, he headed towards one of the enemy's primary hangars in the location of the black hole generator, the device responsible for powering some of the portals that allowed the aliens to instantaneously travel to Earth. Before he could get to his destination, he'd have to travel through the Strog Labs, a horrific location where the mechanized monsters conducted experiments on human beings. He ran past many comrades on his way through, each of which had been driven insane from exposure to the horrors they'd faced. This no doubt enraged Bitterman, but despite the depressing scene, he pushed onward. Once through, Bitterman closed the main hangars, which were integral to launching Strog aircraft in the area. With the local enemy air force's wings clipped, his compatriots were free to do flybys. So he ordered an airstrike on what appeared to be the primary fuel supply that was powering the black hole generator. The missiles hit their mark, decommissioning the generator and supposedly turning off the slip gates the Strog used to transport their ships to Earth. Whether or not this was truly successful is unclear. Either way, with its destruction, only one final objective remained. It was time to kill the Macron. All manner of new horrors attempted to impede his progress at just about every turn. One such entity was the Iron Maiden, one of the only female Strahd configurations. These vile women made some weird noises and possessed some outrageously big personalities. Uh, Anyways, their primary attack was a rocket launcher and it was deadly, but fortunately for Bitterman, not deadly enough to stop him. He fought his way through Cerberon's palace and eventually came face to inhuman face with the monster he sought, the Macron. Before he could take a shot, the fiend activated a teleporter and disappeared. A small wave of enemies ambushed our hero and he put them down with great prejudice. With them dead, he was free to reactivate the portal the Macron had used to escape. He stepped on a few pressure plates and pressed a few buttons, powering on the device. As he did so, a strange voice called out to him, taunting and beckoning him forward. He approached the portal, stepped in, took hold of a quad damage, and buried it deep in his pocket. It would be useful later. Bitterman rematerialized somewhere else. He was aboard some kind of space station embedded in a rock, suspended far above the surface of Stragos. He could see distant stars and asteroids through the windows of the space facility. Looks pretty familiar, doesn't it? Almost like the realm of astrologers from Dimension of the Machine. He attempted to ping his trusty compass, but instead of creating a comforting string of green arrows, nothing happened. He was well and truly on his own, not even able to make use of his reliable guidance system to aid him. He moved down the space station's dingy hallways, found an elevator at the end, put one foot forward, and stepped on. The moment his body rested on the device, it activated, carrying him upwards. He no doubt steeled himself for the confrontation he knew to be coming. Once the lift stopped, a large area stretched out before him, and in the center, a gigantic cybernetic monstrosity, the Macron, or rather, a Jorg, which served as an extra layer of mechanized mayhem and protection for the Supreme Leader. He shoved his hand deep into his pocket, retrieved his trusty quad damage, activated it, then whipped out one of the deadliest weapons in his arsenal, the BFG-10,000. Yes, you heard that right. A different version of the BFG, as in the BFG Doom guy is so fond of. The Strog leader didn't hesitate and immediately opened up a salvo of bullets with its twin chain guns. Bitterman unloaded on the beast, each bullet dealing four times the damage, and because of that, before he knew it, the Macron's armor started to deteriorate. Eventually, it crumbled and exploded, revealing a smaller entity. The large mech was merely a shell for the Macron to hide within. 
At this point though, the alien leader didn't stand a chance. Its greatest weapon had been destroyed and Bitterman made short work of the abomination. As it died, a strange inhuman laughter echoed throughout the space around him. The voice, which he initially had assumed to be the voice of the Macron, chuckled evilly as the building around Bitterman started to fall apart. It was a trap, and once the Macron fell, the space station started to self-destruct, but where was the laughter coming from? Who was the source? He didn't have time to contemplate the question. He ran as fast as he could to the nearest escape pod, jumped in, activated the ship's systems, and narrowly escaped as the asteroid base he was in moments before erupted into flame. His stolen pod flew through space on a trajectory towards the surface of Stragos. After a short flight, it smashed into the planet's rugged terrain and the entrance hatch blew open. Bitterman had survived and stretched his hand outwards in a fist before climbing out. He had completed his mission, but in so doing, he was still stuck on the surface of the planet. His fate from this point onwards is unclear. He seemingly eventually made his way home, but when or how is still a mystery. What we do know, however, is that he was eventually abducted by his enemies and partially strogified. Parts of his body were replaced with cybernetic enhancements, but despite that, he still remained himself. When or how this happened isn't revealed, and why the Strog weren't able to complete the transformation is also unclear. Perhaps it was his tenacity or his unquenchable thirst for victory that kept him sane, but that is another story. Either way, his final fate, much like the Rangers, is still a mystery. As it turns out, Bitterman wasn't the only survivor from the original human invasion force. In fact, a man by the name of Joker somehow managed to land on the Strog homeworld surface relatively unscathed as well. This may have been due to the fact that his drop pod clipped an asteroid during his descent, but whatever the case may be, like Bitterman, his pod smashed into the surface of the planet's rugged landscape. He climbed out, blaster in hand, and quickly found his trusty shotgun sitting in the mud not far from the mucky puddle his drop pod crash landed in. He strode forward, retrieved it, and pushed onwards. After a brief walk through a canyon, the sounds of a distant splashing made their way to Joker, and the source of the sound was revealed. A strange, strictly biological creature with no cybernetic enhancements. A creature his intel had informed him was called a Gek. These deadly amphibious animals were extremely fast, often hunting in packs and utilizing their sharp claws and teeth to attack. These creatures were seemingly native to the strong homeworld, but their place of origin was irrelevant to Joker. He fired his shotgun into the animal, each shot causing its skin to glow brighter with a strange bioluminescence until it fell and exploded. He made his way through the bog until he reached a strong facility, seemingly some kind of sewage system. He ventured inside and fought his way through, using the complex as a means to enter a strong military base. Once inside, he received new orders from his command ship. It was up to Joker to infiltrate the compound and retrieve information regarding a Strog Counter-Strike fleet, an attack force potentially capable of fighting off the human invaders. The enemy wasn't going to let him get the information easily, though. At every chance they could, they'd impede his progress, eventually forcing him to venture outside of the facility and into the swamps once more. Strange moaning sounds echoed off the floors and walls of the caverns he swam through, a sound which appeared to be emanating from the Gek. It almost seemed like they were speaking to one another. Perhaps these creatures were more than just mindless monsters. He followed the source of the sounds until he found a few of the creatures standing at a doorway, moaning incessantly. What their goal was is unclear. Perhaps these creatures were no friends of the Strog, and like humanity, had been needlessly attacked by them. Joker slowly and hesitantly walked towards the door they were in front of, slipping past the creatures and moving on. The deeper he went into the military complex, the more the Strog threw at him. He eventually found himself in a large open space when suddenly an upgraded version of the super tank rolled its way towards him. This hulking beast was even deadlier than his counterpart, the regular super tank, thanks to its heat-seeking rockets and personal shielding device. Without thinking, Joker fired round after round into the beast until it started to falter. Before the creature fell, another identical tank made an appearance. Joker ran and dodged both of their incoming rockets as best as he could, and after many spent bullet casings littered the floor, both heat-seeking super tanks laid there dead. With such heavy resistance, he must have been close to his objective. He moved past their corpses and finally found his prize, the information he'd sought, the location of the incoming Strog Counter-Strike Force. The entire group was located on one of Strogos' moons, but he wasn't able to get there straight from his location. First, he'd have to travel through a Strog industrial zone, and while he was there, destroy one of their fuel production facilities. In order to do this, he'd have to provide ground support to help facilitate an incoming airstrike. The problem was, the airstrike marker had been stolen by the local Gek population. He'd have to retrieve it in order to proceed, and this meant traveling through the bizarre creature's lair. Many dead Gek later, and Joker would finally make his way to the beacon, which was surrounded by the anomalous amphibians, each of which was seemingly chanting. As he approached, they paid him no mind. It seemed as though they were far too preoccupied doing whatever it was they were doing. 
Joker took this to his advantage and made his way up and around to a ledge that would give him access to the airstrike beacon. He jumped off the ledge and grabbed his prize, but the moment his hand made contact with it, the chanting Gek rushed him. They weren't pleased he'd taken the device and intended to forcefully take it back. Joker wasn't about to let some slimy frog people stop him from destroying the Strog fuel processing plant though, and using his now varied arsenal, he killed them all. Airstrike marker in hand, he brought the device to where the Air Force's destructive salvo would do the most damage, set it down, stepped back, and watched the fireworks. Joker then made his way to a Strog tram station, which carried him to a spaceport. All he had to do was fight through to get to the moon housing the Strog counterattack fleet. Unsurprisingly, he killed many of the aliens on his way through the facility until he finally climbed inside an empty shipping container and allowed himself to be loaded into a freight vessel bound for Stragos' moon. Once the ship arrived at its destination, Joker busted out of the crate he'd stowed away in and made his way towards the freighter's exit. Monster after monster fell beneath his guns until he arrived at the bridge. Its crew perished to his vicious onslaught, but when they fell, the ship initiated an automated self-destruct sequence. He rushed to disable the mechanism as quickly as he could and was just narrowly successful. With that done, he exited the vehicle and stepped into the moon base. In order to complete his primary objective, he'd need to destroy the entire facility and consequently the Strog's counterattack fleet. To do this, he'd have to disable the induction coils for the facility's reactor, thus triggering a reactor core meltdown. Once all coils had been disabled, a single switch remained that when flipped would finally allow him to achieve his goal. The catch was, there was one hell of an enforcer guarding it, a Jorg, and inside of it, yet another Macron. There was only supposed to be one of these entities, but as we know, Bitterman was likely fighting his own Macron right now too. The evil entity unleashed a hail of bullets, and Joker did the best he could to dodge them, ducking and weaving whenever possible. After a long and hard-fought battle, the Jorg exploded, leaving the Macron exposed. Rinse and repeat. He fired round after round until it too fell. With the alien dead, Joker was now free to finish his mission. One console stood between him and the destruction of the moon base with the fleet inside it. He stepped forward and activated the terminal. Joker sprinted through the complex, explosions reverberating through the walls around him. Large pieces of the ceiling crashed down, almost smashing him beneath their immense weight, but the soldier was light on his feet and managed to dodge every single one. He finally made his way to a hangar, and within it was a small aircraft. Without hesitation, he hopped in and launched out of the base, escaping just as it exploded. He piloted his ship off into space as command radioed him, confirming he'd completed his mission. His fate beyond this point is unclear, though it's likely that he rendezvoused with the rest of his platoon to fight another day. Much like Bitterman and Joker, another Marine managed to survive the hellish descent onto the surface of Stragos. This man's call sign was Stepchild, and his goal was different from our previous heroes. The Strog had built a generator that was capable of increasing the strength of the planet's gravitational field. This, coupled with the other issues such as the big gun, made landing on the planet absolute hell for the soldiers coming down in their drop pods. So, his objective was to destroy the gravity wave device. On his way down, he managed to dodge several Strog fighter craft, one of which was destroyed right next to him, likely by the ship he'd taken off from, the Deimos. Like the Phobos, this capital ship had been named after one of Mars' moons and appears to be its sister ship. His drop pod smashed onto the surface of the planet like many of his comrades had done before, and when he landed, he quickly moved out towards his objective. His first goal was to establish a comms link with command, and once that was done, he'd have to travel through a Strog mine. When his pod crashed, it had partially broken through the planet's crust and embedded within a cave system which the Strog had been using to mine a crystalline substance called Thalite. The purpose of this mineral is unclear, but due to its volatility, it's possible that the Strog used it to manufacture some of their explosive weaponry. As he traveled through the mines, naturally he killed any enemies that got in his way, and of course, sabotaged key systems. Shortly after, he attempted to rendezvous with another incoming marine, but as he arrived to the drop location, the fellow soldier's ship was shot down, causing it to crash and explode. This no doubt struck Stepchild with grief, but he didn't have the time to mourn. He had a job to do. He made his way to a tram and rode it to his next objective. While in his pursuit to destroy the gravity generator, his commanding officers wanted him to interrupt the Strog fighter communications as well. Once he'd accomplished this, he traveled to an enemy hangar which contained an experimental Strog aircraft. Before he could make his way to the aircraft, he'd need to call an airstrike to destroy an anti-air turret so that it could be extracted. The resulting explosion from the airstrike exposed a new pathway for Stepchild to continue on his mission, and so he stepped through it. When he finally arrived, he was greeted by a massive aerial monstrosity that his intel had labeled a carrier. Its two chain guns, railgun, and grenade launcher were already extremely deadly, but it also had the ability to teleport flyers to its location for backup. Stepchild fired all he had into the beast until it fell, and once it did, he was free to secure the experimental ship. For now, he'd leave it in the hangar bay. He may need it later. He moved out of the building and headed towards a munitions depot. 
In it, he stole a piece of the Strog's own weaponry, specifically an antimatter bomb. Once he acquired it, he hauled his ass into a gondola, which promptly delivered him to the gravity well. The moment he arrived, he noticed a drop pod wedged into the wall next to him. As he approached, he could hear the screams of his fellow comrade, call sign Wanamal, begging to be released. Unfortunately for the occupant, Stepchild had no way to free him. No doubt with a heavy heart, our hero moved onwards to plant the bomb. The Strog weren't about to let him off easy though. To defend the device, a Black Widow had been deployed in the area. This absolutely massive bipedal mech, seemingly female, was an absolute force to be reckoned with. It fired lasers and railgun shots at Stepchild as often as it could, but worse yet, the evil entity also had the ability to summon stalkers at will. These crab-like Strog were extremely quick on their feet and possessed a dead laser weapon. They also had the ability to climb along ceilings. However, none of this was as frightening as the fact that the evil entity possessed its very own quad damage. No human had encountered this particular foe and survived to tell about it. Stepchild almost certainly hoped and prayed he'd be the first. The Marine was a badass though, and using his arsenal, he defeated the Black Widow and her minions, or at least, so it seemed. Before the monster perished, the upper half of its body teleported away, vanishing from sight and leaving Stepchild alone in the arena with nothing but a few stalkers. He took them down, of course, and then suddenly, a loud thudding sound reverberated throughout the room. Without warning, a door on the far side of the arena burst open, and standing on the other side was the Black Widow, this time in a gigantic spider-like chassis with even deadlier weaponry than before. This didn't stop Stepchild though, and unlike her, he didn't need a fancy suit to defeat his enemies. He fired more and more into the evil witch until she finally fell, for real this time. As the creature died, he made his move. He planted the bomb at the machine's core and then sprinted towards a nearby transport pod. The vehicle carried him to the hangar where he'd left the experimental strong craft, and once he arrived, he threw himself inside, informed command to evacuate any survivors before the bomb detonated, and took off through the still closed hangar doors. He piloted the ship upwards and beyond the planet's atmosphere, where he was retrieved by the Demos. His commanding officers congratulated him for his victory, and now that he'd been reunited with his superiors, he could take a well-deserved rest. Thanks to the efforts of Bitterman, Joker, and Stepchild, humanity was able to launch a full-scale attack on Stragos. With no big gun to knock their ships out of the sky or gravity well to suck them in, additional forces could work their way to the planet's surface. One particular marine by the name of Corporal Matthew Kane, a member of a group called Rhino Squad, was aboard a troop carrier en route to the alien's world. He wasn't an ordinary marine, though. He had become something of a legend among his compatriots thanks to the fact that he was mysteriously the sole survivor of the destruction of a space station. How he managed this, he wouldn't say. Suddenly, something struck the craft he was in, and it immediately started to fall out of the sky. The crash was devastating, killing several of the outfit upon landing. Matthew survived, however, and when he hobbled out of the debris of the crashed ship, he spoke to a few other survivors. One of them assigned him his newest objective, rendezvous with the rest of his group. After receiving these instructions, he moved into a nearby building, and with the help of a few Marines from another fire team, Badger Squad, they killed their first few strong soldiers. Aided by a medic, he patched up a wounded comrade and continued on his path to the rest of his unit. Once there, Matthew was given new orders. It was up to him to destroy several Strog hangar bays to give the local Air Force more of a fighting chance. Without hesitation, he penetrated the aircraft launch sites, met up with another fire team called Viper Squad, and together they took down any enemy resistance in the facilities. After they'd all fallen, they were free to plant bombs in the area. A fellow soldier, an EOD, activated the devices, crippling the local Strog Air Force and giving the GDF pilots a much needed hand. His next objective was to secure a nearby AA gun, and after doing so, Kane hopped into the weapon. He pointed the massive turret at a nearby doorway that the Strog had locked down and fired around, blowing a massive hole in the structure. Shortly after, he exited the gun and his comrades planted explosives on the device to knock it out of commission. Now that he'd taken care of the weapon, he could push through to a landing zone and board a carrier called the Hannibal. As he walked through the ship, he overheard scientists and other Marines having conversations. A few were discussing how the Strog employed some kind of highly advanced nanobot to repair themselves in the field. Field. Others commented on Matthew's arrival and expressed surprise regarding his sole survival after the destruction of the Armstrong space station. Matthew made his way to one of the Hannibal's briefing rooms and received his new orders. The Strog used a communication system called the Nexus that allowed them to instantaneously beam orders to their troops from any location. If it was destroyed, their battle net would be in disarray, giving the Marines more of an edge. In order to accomplish this, Matthew and co. would need to deliver an EMP device deep into the heart of the Strog facility. Kane and his friends loaded into a heavy ground vehicle and headed towards this new goal, rolling their way through the Strog's defenses. A laser grid was blocking their path, and in order for them to continue, it needed to be disabled. The console 
control to turn the fortification off was located inside a nearby base, so Matthew headed out of his vehicle and went in on foot to get the job done. Deep within, he'd encounter many of his fellow soldiers and strong enemies alike. Eventually, he'd arrive at a console, and once he interacted with it, the laser grid was disabled. With it powered down, he was free to hop into a tank and use it to push his way towards the Strog Nexus. He faced extremely heavy resistance and several new Strog configurations on his warpath. He encountered large aircraft, agile balls that rolled out of the way of his shots, gigantic missile-wielding soldiers, and immense spider-like ground vehicles called Harvesters. It didn't matter, though. Whatever they sent Matthew's way, he laid to waste until he arrived at the Strog Nexus. Nexus. Once there, he rendezvoused with his fellow soldiers and made his way inside with the EMP device. Once it was in place, he and his cohorts prepared to activate it, but before it could go off, a harvester busted through a nearby door and destroyed it. With it damaged, they had to find another way to destroy the Strog Nexus Tower. In order to do that, they'd need to sabotage key systems throughout the machine's vast substructure. After interacting with a console that sped this process along, two large Strog soldiers crawled their way out from the shadows, each equipped with extremely heavy weaponry and a set of spider-like legs. They assaulted Matthew with extreme ferocity, but he was far too quick on his feet and they were swiftly defeated. Immediately upon their fall, a never-before-seen configuration of Macron burst through the door in front of him. It laughed maniacally and mockingly as it unloaded on the Lone Marine. Either its weapons were far too great, or Matthew simply wasn't as deadly as Bitterman Joker or Stepchild, because the beast laid him to waste. As he sat on the floor, the monstrosity moved forward, lifted him into the air to look into the dying man's eyes, and just like that, everything went black. When Matthew regained consciousness, he found himself strapped to a strange pod that was attached to a conveyor belt. He struggled to get free, but his fighting didn't help, and it carried him along all the same. The Marine knew what was happening, though. He knew exactly what his adversaries were planning to do. He was going to be strogified. He wriggled and writhed against his restraints, but no amount of fighting would release him. Sinister mechanisms of evil whirred all around him, and as he moved along the line, a giant needle plunged into his stomach, ripping a hole in his abdomen and seemingly injecting him with steroids so that he'd have a greater chance of surviving the process that awaited. Next, he was carried towards a large rotary blade that extended from above. As it revved up, the screams of another powerless human being pierced his ears from just ahead. The rotary blade's speed quickened as it moved towards his legs and began sawing them off slightly above the knee. The pain was so intense that he blacked out, but unfortunately for him, he didn't awake as if from a horrific nightmare. Instead, when he opened his eyes, he was still strapped into the machine. He moved further along the assembly line as the vile mechanisms attached cybernetic limbs to his stumps, a metallic harness to his chest, and painfully injected something into his brain via a forceful puncture wound. The voices of strong commands echoing throughout the complex suddenly became more and more clear until they resolved into something he could understand, almost as if they were speaking English. He helplessly approached the final step of the strongification process, activating the object they'd implanted into his brain, officially taking over his mind. Just moments before the machine could accomplish its foul goal, his fellow members of Rhino Squad busted into the room and eliminated the nearby Strog. One of the men then raised his weapon and prepared to fire upon Matthew while he remained stuck inside the glass pod, but before he could pull the trigger, their commanding officer, Voss, stopped him. He knew Matthew was still in there, and he wasn't about to let one of his men get gunned down, no matter how hideous he'd become. Voss ordered one of his men to smash the glass and free him. Matthew was mere moments from completing the transformation, but with the machine stopped, he had been spared. And even though he had been horribly disfigured, he pushed forward. His body had been mangled beyond repair, and he was now more technology than human, but he also gained a few helpful abilities. For one, he could hear whenever the Strog issued new orders, giving him a tactical advantage. And for two, he could make use of the Strog's joint health stations whenever he was injured. The local GDF forces had received a heavy blow while he was undergoing his unwanted surgery, and a general order was issued to retreat and regroup. Matthew was deep within enemy lines, though, and he'd have to fight his way out to follow these new orders. Using a deadly human mech, he marched through one of the most strog-infested areas he'd encountered so far, laying waste to all manner of elite alien forces. In order to meet up with his friends, he'd have to push through a Stroyant production facility, absolutely overrun with strong forces. Once he arrived, he fought all the way to the center of the installation. Ominously, a loud, low, moaning sound was echoing throughout the tubes around him, originating from somewhere off in the distance. Undoubtedly unnerved, he moved on until he was confronted with a massive beating heart which had been hooked up to all manner of tubes and wires. This heart appeared to work much like an actual cardiovascular system, pumping blood, or in this case, stroyant, across different areas of Stragos. Thanks to his partial strogification, Matthew was able to read some of the computer screens nearby, and because of that, he was able to overload the system. This effectively killed the heart, thus cutting off a valuable supply source for the aliens. 
He continued to push onward through the factory of horrors, passing through corridors filled with fleshy tubes that seemed to wriggle and writhe of their own volition. The eerie moaning sound that he had heard earlier was back now too, and as he stepped through a door, its source finally became clear to him. A hideously bloated monstrosity that was plugged into the walls and tubes of the facility sat before him. Apparently, this was a stroyant processing creature. Stroyant, as in the same substance he had been using to heal since his partial strogification. This, without a doubt, appalled Matthew, disgusting him to his very core, and he quickly determined that this hideous creature needed to die. Due to the creature's thick layers of body fat, bullets wouldn't harm it, so Matthew made his way towards the device designed to feed the creature. He activated it, thereby forcing it to eat until its stomach literally exploded. The volatile acids within its huge gut spilled out and onto the ground below. The body fluids were so acidic that they instantly burned a hole through the floor, opening up a new path for the solitary marine. With nowhere else to go, Matthew jumped through and into the next area, the utterly disgusting and truly horrifying waste processing facility. This heinous place seemed to be where the Strog disposed of all of the extra fleshy scrap and otherwise unwanted biomass that they couldn't use to fuel their war machine. He trudged through the sticky hallways, the stench of decay no doubt stinging his nostrils. Corpses were scattered about everywhere, each in various stages of decomposition. The barrel suddenly tipped over, and a partially strogified soldier crawled out. The zombie-like creature hobbled towards Matthew, spewing acidic vomit in his direction. As disturbing as the creature was, its unpleasant visage didn't stop the soldier from blowing it away and moving onwards. After fighting his way through tons of zombie-like monsters, he suddenly stumbled upon his commanding officer, his friend, and the man that saved him from complete strogification. Except, he was wrong. He had become one of them. His torso had been affixed to a massive hulking chassis and he yelled at Matthew, urging him to leave. He still had his mental faculties, but he couldn't control his body for long. Matthew wasn't about to leave his friend in such a sorry state, and so he prepared to put the man out of his misery. After a very hard fought battle, his former ally eventually collapsed. No doubt with a heavy heart, if such a thing still beat within him, he headed out of the facility into a troop transport, and once inside, the pilot flew them to the Hannibal. The medics looked him over, and unfortunately, the Strog implants were wired directly into his nervous system, meaning there was no way to remove them. Undeterred, he headed towards his next mission briefing, and as he walked, his fellow soldiers looked upon him with disgust. All they saw was a Strog. He didn't seem to care, though, putting the mission ahead of everything else. His next objective was similar to his last failed mission. The Nexus still needed to be destroyed, but as it turned out, a single EMP wouldn't have actually done the trick. The sprawling machine's core needed to be destroyed. Then, and only then, would it fall. During his briefing, the Strog suddenly attacked the Hannibal, and many of the soldiers rushed to defend it. Matthew had a more important task, though. He ran to his drop pod, climbed in, and blasted off towards his objective, the Nexus. In order to gain access to its core, he'd first have to climb to the top of three towers that surrounded the construct and activate a mechanism at their apex. As he climbed to the top of each tower, he faced heavy resistance, but despite that, he managed to achieve his goal. With the first two towers done, only one remained. As he climbed the third and final building, an absolutely massive Strog made an appearance. This hulking beast was protecting the Nexus Tower, and it wasn't about to let Matthew finish his mission without a fight. The further up he made it in the third tower, the more aggressive the beast became. It shot at the building and ripped it to pieces whenever Matthew was nearby in an attempt to kill the soldier, or at least impede his progress. Despite the behemoth's best efforts, Matthew was able to make it to the top of the final tower anyways, but once he arrived, the massive monstrosity confronted him. The two of them engaged in combat, and after what must have surely felt like an eternity to Matthew, the evil entity finally fell. With the Guardian dead, he was free to activate the device atop the last tower, finally granting him access to the Nexus. Once he interacted with the switch, a portal opened that would instantly transport him there, but it was equipped with what appeared to be some kind of failsafe. Any non-Strog entity who entered the gateway would be killed, but fortunately for Matthew, he was part Strog, and because of this, he could pass through. He prepared himself for his final battle, then stepped into the portal. The Nexus core was heavily guarded, and so Matthew was forced to battle through hordes of extremely deadly Strog configurations. The soldier had an iron will, though, and no matter how hard the aliens tried to stop him, they failed. Once he'd arrived at the heart of the mechanism, he was assaulted by a Macron, the same one that was responsible for his partial Strog conversion. Matthew's pain had been great, and because of that, he'd make the monster pay. It was time for a rematch. 
As he fought, he lost track of how many times he pulled the triggers of his weapons. He was operating completely on muscle memory, or at least what little bit of that he still possessed. Once the warlord had been significantly weakened, it fell onto the ground. A large purple beam struck it, and it detached from its mechanized legs, taking to the air and raining hellfire down upon the marine. This new movement pattern was quick and deadly, but Matthew was an absolute force to be reckoned with. Shot after shot, explosive after explosive, and eventually the Macron ceased its fight. With the warrior out of the way, the Nexus core was now fully exposed. A large brain-like mechanism slowly raised out of the ground below Matthew's feet. He couldn't damage it though, as the disgusting technological biological hybrid abomination was protected by an impenetrable layer of energy shielding. Deadly strong troops teleported in from all directions to attack the lone marine as he tried to figure out a way to bring the protective barrier down. A small blue battery-like mechanism sat above the Nexus, and as Matthew laid his eyes on it, he knew what had to be done. Quickly, he swapped to one of his deadliest weapons and fired a rocket at the device. The missile made its way home and exploded, causing the energy shield to momentarily fail. This was it. He was free to damage the Nexus, at least for a time. He unloaded everything he had on it, and eventually, it exploded. With it destroyed, the Strog's communications were screwed, giving the GDF soldiers a much needed advantage. If their enemy couldn't coordinate, maybe, just maybe, they could be defeated. Shortly after the destruction of the Nexus, the Marine hero made his way back to his friends and fellow soldiers. There, he would receive new orders. It's unclear what his next objective would be, but it's likely that he still fights on, even today. A brief disclaimer. It's not known when exactly Call of the Machine takes place, but given a few subtle references to Quake 4, the previous chapter of this video, I'm inclined to believe that it takes place sometime after. Bitterman, Joker, Stepchild, and Matthew may have been successful at killing three Macrons, crippling the Strog's infrastructure, destroying their gravity well, destroying their moon base, and eliminating the thought-to-be impenetrable Nexus Tower, but their missions were just a few of many. They may have completed all of their goals, but even then, the war was not over, and though they no doubt hurt the aliens immensely, their success didn't spell the end for the Strog. The next series of conflicts is shrouded in mystery, and there are some elements that are very unclear. This part of the story begins within a strange space station, or perhaps a ship seemingly high above the surface of Stragos. How this particular marine managed to get here is unknown. His call sign appears to be the machine, based on the words being inscribed on his drop pod, much like Bitterman, Joker, and Stepchild's before him. Whether or not this is actually his title or simply a reference to the actual location itself is also unclear, but considering that's been the go-to identifier for soldiers thus far, I'll refer to him as such from now on. It's worth noting that the design of the building bears more than a passing resemblance to the machine that the ranger found himself in sometime after his fight with Shabnigaroth. Once the machine, as in the man, walked through the first hallway, he approached the center of the odd building, and within it was a circle. This object was suspended in the air and spun slowly as he stared at it. His mission briefing stated his objective was to deploy marines from the adjacent rooms to collect data, and that once all data was collected, a portal to the Strog Maker would open. With this goal in mind, the machine moved into the next area and approached a console. This particular button would send a soldier on a mission called Operation Laser Eyes. The marine sent on this objective came down in his drop pod, which was adorned with a rainbow and the initials CG. Once he landed, he shook himself off and pushed forward. At the end of this specific gauntlet was a data disk containing a key piece of information that was crucial to unlocking access to the Strog Maker. CG pushed his way through the facility but faced heavy resistance. The Strog really didn't want these data disks falling into human hands, it seemed. They deployed all manner of monstrosities to try and stop him, but he laid them all to waste. Once he acquired the disk, he made his way to a terminal to upload the information it contained, but as he approached the path to it, the Strog unleashed a gigantic creature, the blood-starved mutant. This mutant was much larger than its kin and attacked him with unprecedented ferocity. It appeared to have been enhanced somehow by the Strog, and they clearly had planned to use it against CG. The lone soldier dodged its lunges until it finally fell, then worked his way towards a satellite tower to upload the information on the data disk. Naturally, when he arrived at the satellite tower, the dish was misaligned and was unable to send the information. This meant that he was forced to backtrack all the way to the base of the tower, fighting hordes of enemies along the way to activate a switch and realign it. Once that was done, he headed back up again. More enemies awaited him on his ascent, and despite their overwhelming numbers, he made minced meat out of them. Once he got to the top, he transmitted the data, and as soon as the upload completed, a friendly airstrike took down the satellite. CG was likely extracted shortly after. Next on the machine's agenda was Operation Wastelands. The commander pressed a switch to initiate the objective, and once he did, a soldier by the call sign of Positivity was dispatched via a drop pod. The Marine fought his way through several Strog facilities until he made his way to a junkyard where he'd be cut off by a particularly deadly carrier, the Garbage Carrier. 
This carrier was different from others of its ilk. Instead of summoning flyers, it summoned far deadlier stalkers. With such a dangerous spawning capability, fighting the boss wasn't easy, but positivity was eventually victorious. Giant enemies like this were usually only dispatched to protect important things. Therefore, he must have been close to the data disk. Once the carrier died, he made his way past the corpse and into a nearby building. Within was the data disk, guarded by a medic commander, an upgraded version of the medic unit, both of which had the ability to almost instantly resurrect their fallen comrades. Positivity made sure it wouldn't resurrect anything ever again and took hold of the data disk. All he needed to do now was upload the information. He made his way outside to where his pod had landed, not far from which was a tower of some kind that would allow him to send the information contained on the data disk to the machine. The Strog had deployed a particularly deadly commander and several other elite tier enemies to stop him, but using his wits, lots of bullets, and a little bit of positivity, he slayed them all and proceeded to upload the data. With that task completed, next on the agenda was Operation Corpse Run. The machine activated a switch and another pod was ejected, launching Sir Gavi towards the location of the next data disk, which was located on Mega Corpse 4. It's unclear if this was the name of a specific Strog facility or if this was an entirely different planet than the alien's homeworld. Whatever the case may be, it was still overrun with the monsters, and Sir Gubby had no choice but to battle through them. Much like those that came before him, this marine had an impressive skill set and managed to make his way deep into the facility. Eventually, he'd come into contact with the Gate Warden, a particularly deadly hornet with the aid of an army of mutants. Sir Gubby was quick on his feet, though, and after several near-fatal dodges, a pile of corpses laid around him. A hatch promptly opened up in the center of the room. Inside it was a slipgate, but not a strong slipgate. No, no, this slipgate was different, somehow darker, literally and figuratively. With nowhere else to go, he jumped in. Sir Gubby found himself in an infinite abyss with nothing but blackness surrounding him. A strange roaring sound moved around, and odd orbs of glowing light winked in and out of his view. Suddenly, he reappeared on a human-made base. He looked out the window, and much to his surprise, he could see the Earth. He was on Luna, the Earth's moon. Upon looking around the area, he realized the base had been overrun by Strog. Several fellow soldiers laid at his feet, dead. It was solely up to him to clear the place out, so he pressed on. He didn't want to keep the bastards waiting. He stepped through a door and saw a single human survivor immediately get gunned down by a few Strog soldiers. This no doubt enraged him, and he quickly annihilated them all, pushing forward with what was surely a renewed sense of purpose. Apparently, the Marines within the moon base had acquired one of the data disks that would lead to the location of the Strog Maker, so Sir Gubby shifted his objective towards uploading the data. The Strog weren't going to make it easy, though. They had already deployed communications jammers throughout the facility. He'd have to disable them before he could upload the data for the machine to access. Defending the jammer was yet another Macron, the same configuration that Bitterman and Joker had defeated before him. Fortunately for the lone Marine, it wasn't equipped with a Jorg, and was far easier to dispatch than the variant Matthew had encountered. He destroyed the beast as quickly as he could and moved closer towards the source of the signal jamming. Below the first arena were two additional, much smaller Macron, which had apparently been dubbed Children of the Macron. Looks like he was about to be a child killer then. They may have been small, but their damage output was big, and with two of them, the battle wasn't easy, but eventually Sir Gubby stood on top. Once they fell, the data transmitted, and the very building around him began to deteriorate. Sadly, it appears that Sir Gubby was lost in the resulting explosions. Back aboard the space station, or command ship, the machine prepared to initiate yet another mission, this time Operation Firewall. The Marine sent on this particular mission was named Ericsson, and he'd have to travel through the Strog Flesh Labs in order to find the next data disk. As he pushed through the facility, a new objective was transmitted to him. He needed to meet up with the rest of his squad on his way to the data disk. The moment he arrived, of course, they were all killed by Strog forces. Ericsson unloaded on the freaks and, likely with a heavy heart, moved further into the complex. Impeding his way forward was a sealed door with no way through. It didn't matter, though. He'd make his own door. He approached a nearby orbital gun, took control of it, aimed it at the entryway, and fired, blasting a more than human-sized hole into the wall. This particular data disk was heavily fortified, and as he got closer and closer to it, the Strog security became stronger and stronger. Deadly blue laser grids blocked his path and constantly created new hazards. He jumped over rotating laser beams as if he was playing the world's most twisted game of jump rope, where the price of failure was the removal of his legs. He was also constantly under fire from walls upon walls of turrets, small ovoid devices that fired various projectiles. The GDF must have trained their soldiers unbelievably well, because he dodged them all. After he made his way through, he acquired the data disk, but before he could exit, he was stopped by yet another Macron. So much for these things being rare. This particular Macron was called the System Administrator, but I doubt Erickson cared. The monster was between him and his objective. It needed to die, and it certainly wouldn't do that on its own, so he decided to help it along. Now that was done, he could freely upload the data disk to the machine. 
Ericsson was likely extracted shortly after. The next mission the machine was going to tackle was Operation Ruined Earth. The Marine sent on this job was Brickslayer, and his goal was twofold. One, find the data disk and upload it to the machine. Two, discover the whereabouts of a Marine unit designated MG-3. Once his pod made landfall, the soldier found himself within a sewer system and began slowly working his way through its damp tunnels, killing any mutants that got in its way. On the bright side, at least he was on his home turf. I'm sure it was probably comforting to be fighting on Earth instead of a distant alien world. He followed his compass until it finally led him to the squad of Marines. Unsurprisingly, all but two had been killed and the only survivors had lost their minds in the process. The presence of Gek and mutants on this particular operation was interesting because it indicated that the Strog had started deploying them as unwilling soldiers for their army. A sign of desperation, perhaps. For some reason, the Strog were mining here, but what resources they hoped to extract from Earth is unclear. Regardless, Brickslayer made his way into a nearby Strog ship, the source of the mining operation, to retract several immense drills that were impeding his progress. Once that was done, he headed to an exit and back out onto the land of his home world. After walking along the surface of the planet for a little while, he came into contact with another enemy, a Strog super tank. Brickslayer's goal was clear, and this creature wasn't about to stop him. After a deadly exchange that surely felt as though it lasted forever, the creature finally fell. Shortly after, he found the data disk, but when he picked it up, he was immediately assaulted by a Strog carrier. He shot it until it died, and he was attacked yet again, this time by a Strog mega tank. Whatever was in this disk must have been important, because the Strog seemed to throw all they had at him to prevent him from getting the information to the machine. He wasn't going to let them stop him, and so he unloaded everything he had on the commanders, just narrowly surviving the ordeal. Likely limping from the altercation, Brickslayer made his way to a console and uploaded the data, at which point he probably waited for extraction. Back up in the space station, the machine had only one mission left to initiate, Operation Darkest Depths. They were so close to their goal now, only one objective from unlocking a door to the Strog Maker. He pressed the button in front of him and deployed the final Marine. Rather bizarrely, this Marine's entry craft was devoid of any markings, and because of that, his call sign is unknown. Why he hadn't added some personal flair to his drop pod isn't clear, but perhaps it was due to an individual with a mindset more in line with standard militaristic rigidity. The unnamed man's goal was to infiltrate an excavation site and retrieve a series of seismic readings. What his commanding officers needed them for, why they cared in the first place, or how this was related to the Strog wasn't exactly explicit, but whatever the case may be, it was his mission and he was going to accomplish it. The soldier moved through the canyon, and as he did so, a new objective was sent to him. Not only did he need to gather the seismic data, but he needed to find out what happened to another group of Marines, Badger Squad, likely the same group of Marines that Matthew had worked with during his fight. As he made his way deeper into the cave system, he'd stumble upon a few of their bodies, but for the most part, they seemed to have completely vanished. He eventually made his way far into the facility, crawling through some pipes that led to a small opening. After squeezing himself through, he was instantly assaulted by a straw tank called Overburden. The reason for this strange title is not known. Needless to say, the nameless Marine fired a hail of bullets into the mech until its life signs dwindled. Just beyond its corpse was something odd, something it appeared to have been guarding. Things felt strange now, almost wrong. The architecture had shifted from modern to seemingly ancient. Dominating the Marine's vision was a large pillar of unknown origin, carved into its face a depiction of something something the soldier didn't understand. To us though, the silhouette is all too familiar. The markings represented Shub Nigaroth, the very same entity that the ranger supposedly killed many years ago. Slightly above the ancient evil's depiction was an orb, and above it, two large creatures, shamblers, which appeared to be praying, chanting, it's hard to tell. The Marine no doubt felt unnerved and deeply unsettled by this discovery. He was here to collect seismic readings, not interpret ancient pictographs. He walked past the structure and through a small entryway that had been blasted into a nearby rock face. When he stepped through, he fell, landed, and found himself in some kind of long forgotten structure, a temple. Three large doors were his only way to proceed, and since he'd fallen from a great height, he couldn't return from the way he came. The largest entryway in the center of the room was adorned with carvings similar to the ones on the pillar on his way in. He approached the door, but it didn't open. Instead, a sudden whispering filled his ears, but upon looking around, it had no place of origin. The voice was indiscernible and quiet, but something about it told him it was evil. Had he finally started to lose his mind like many of the soldiers before him? With no other choice, he stepped through the door on his left and walked onwards. He was quickly greeted by more Strog, and though the aliens were terribly evil, their appearance was likely somewhat comforting. The Strog, at least he understood. They didn't typically whisper sweet nothings into his ear as he fought them. At the end of his path was a switch with an unusual and somewhat disturbing face carved into the front. Blood seemed to drip from its open mouth and its appearance was just generally unsettling. As disturbing as any of this may have been, he still had a job to do, and so he continued his descent into the temple. 
The deeper he went, the more prevalent the carvings became. Another large arena eventually stretched out before him. The Shub Nigaroth carvings were everywhere here, and as he walked towards the middle of the chamber, another Strog tank bursted forward and attempted to eliminate him. This beast was called the Underminer, but fortunately for the soldier, it went down just the same as those before it. The very ground he stood on started to quake now, likely the source of the seismic readings he'd been sent here to retrieve. His path eventually led him toward the room with three doors from before, but this time when he entered, the entryway opposite of him had opened. At this point, it was obvious that if he wanted to find out whatever was beyond the larger entrance that seemed to give him a mild case of schizophrenia, he'd have to travel through here first. Not long after entering, a large hole in the floor suddenly opened up beneath him and he fell even deeper into the ancient structure. On the bright side, a data disk containing the seismic readings he'd been sent here for sat in front of him. He stepped forward and retrieved it, but he still needed to upload the information to the machine. With the data disk in hand, he sprinted through the caves, ending up in a large and imposing cavern with a pit so deep it seemed bottomless. At the top of a series of hills was a large triangular door, and behind it, an inky black slipgate of the same size. The lone marine likely clutched his weapons tightly as he stepped forward, and the strange arcane device carried him somewhere else. He reappeared instantly, and a giant hulking creature rushed him. Connected to its enormous and sickly pale body were two gigantic arms, at the end of which were massive claws. The center of its head was devoid of any facial features, save for an enormous mouth. The structures around him were bizarre, but before he could really process what was going on, he was teleported back to the ancient buildings from before. That creature, according to GDF Intel, was a shambler. These hideous monsters were extremely rare, and based on what they'd gathered, they weren't from Stragos at all. It was possible that they were from a previously conquered Strog planet, worked into their army much like the Gek or mutants. Their biology was beyond strange though, and it was possible that they had originated from some other dimension, an entirely different plane of existence. Either way, they weren't sure, but what they were sure of was that they were extremely deadly. Those of you that have experienced the horrors of the original quake, no doubt noticed the room the unnamed marine had found himself inside of. It was one of the very first arenas that the ranger fought the monsters of Shub Nigaroth's army within. A thought suddenly implanted itself in his mind, one not of his own brain's creation. An ancient evil had awoken and he needed to escape. He found himself back inside the large room with three doors and a few strog now guarding the final entryway. He dispatched them with ease and watched as the wall ahead slid open to reveal another ominous portal. The marine no doubt prepared himself for the same monster he'd seen last time and then stepped in. Instead of ending up in the bizarre place, he was in another chamber made of the same architecture the temple he'd been exploring was composed of. He tried to ping his compass, but it was unresponsive. He was well and truly on his own in the bowels of some frightening and previously unknown chamber. He only had one goal now, survive. He sprinted down the hallway in front of him, and once he made it to the end, he was confronted with the same horror he'd seen before, but massive and standing within a large pool of molten rock. Somehow he knew the name of this bizarre entity. It was called Modir, and it wanted him dead. He wasn't about to go down without a fight, though. He shot the creature a few times before quickly realizing that his bullets had no effect. He was going to have to find another way to kill the thing. He ran around the back of the creature and was cut off by another of its ilk, but smaller and not resistant to traditional bullets. He pumped the hideous creature full of buckshot and stood on the platform it seemed to be guarding. The structure lifted him into the air and stopped head level with Modir. The creature flung lightning bolts at him with incredible accuracy, but he jumped past them and made his way to a switch on one side of the room. He hit it, sprinted to the other side, and hit another. A third switch was suddenly revealed on the bottom floor, and with no other choice but to press it, he flung his body down onto it. The room around him shook and quaked, then suddenly a blue beam of concentrated energy blasted through the beast sending its huge guts all across the arena. The soldier jumped into a newly revealed hole and landed on the ground in a chamber of solid blackness. The only thing in front of him was a door, a door with the same depiction of Shub Nigaroth that he'd seen before. What little sanity he had left suddenly slipped away from him and he instantly devolved into a sniveling, drooling mess. At that instant, the machine lost his signal. It seemed as though the seismic readings would remain beyond his reach and that this particular mission was a failure. Either way, with the final operation completed, the Marine Commander could finally enter the dimension of the machine and confront the Strog Maker. Instead of commanding other soldiers, it was time for him to take the battle into his own hands. The strange circular device in the center of the machine was now powered on. As it turns out, it was a slipgate. The machine, as in the man, looked towards it and then leapt through. Once he rematerialized, he found himself in a small arena. A carrier attacked him almost instantly, and once he damaged it immensely, a super tank appeared to assist it. The man suddenly knew these entities' names. The two Strog were the servitors of creation. These weren't who he was after, but he'd kill them all the same. Once they were defeated, an eerie silence filled the cramped hallways around him. A thick and deadly sludge that he'd been navigating around while trying to defeat the servitors suddenly drained, revealing another chamber below. He jumped down and was attacked by two shamblers, monsters he mysteriously knew to be called the Masters of the Machine. 
the strange device he had been working towards powering on, and bizarrely, his call sign. The creatures were pissed though, and needless to say, they wanted him dead. He fought as hard as he could and shot all of the bullets he could possibly muster until both of the beasts died. The walls around him started to explode, and suddenly, the building that surrounded him winked out of existence. He'd succeeded with his goal, and though he hadn't found or killed the Strog Maker, by destroying the mechanism, he knew they'd been cut off from their creator. His victory came at a great cost though, the cost of his own life. With the device destroyed, the soldier, the machine, drifted endlessly in a cosmic void, likely to never escape. So, who or what exactly was the Strog Maker? Well, based on everything we've seen, the answer seems to be Shub Niguroth, the evil eldritch monstrosity from the original Quake. Quake 264 is a strange footnote in this entire saga as it's the only story that appears to be in a different universe. This version of Quake 2 was a heavily modified mission set made to work on the Nintendo 64's much more limited hardware. Despite the fact that it reuses some areas from the regular Quake 2 campaign, it feels like an entirely new expansion pack with new objectives and locations. The only reason the universe this takes place in is questionable is because completing these levels rewards you with an achievement called Shut Down the Core, the description of which says, enter an alternate timeline and destroy the Guardians. That being said, both Doom and Quake take place within a greater multiverse as evident by Quake 3 in the general convoluted nature of Doom's story. Multiple universes or timelines isn't exactly unprecedented in Doom or Quake, so in case Quake 264 does take place in the primary universe, I'm going to go over it really quickly just to cover all bases. Let's just put a big alternate universe asterisk on this entire section of the video. Take it with a grain of salt. Okay, let's go. The beginning of this unnamed Marine's mission, some say his call sign was Viper, had him dropped feet first onto Stragos. The strange thing about it was that the sky, likely due to console limitations, is extremely similar in appearance to the skies from the first Quake, perhaps suggesting that this Marine wasn't actually just on the Strog planet, but perhaps within one of the strange void states from the first game. Probably not, but that would easily reconcile the weirdness regarding this being an alternate timeline if it were true. The unnamed Marine moved through the facility and into the next until he found some explosive charges. Shortly after, he planted them on a nearby Strog console and detonated them. With that done, it was time to exit the facility via a small teleporter which would move him to the next location. His goal in this area was to obtain a data disk containing unspecified information. Once he grabbed it, he needed to head towards a communication array and upload the contents of the disk to his commanding officers. After the disk information had been uploaded, he walked to another teleporter, which transported him to an orbital defense station above Stragos. Once inside, he needed to disable a gravity generator. With the mechanism disabled, he could easily jump across a large gap through space that led to another portion of the station. Before leaving, he grabbed several more Strog explosive devices so that he could sabotage key components in the facility. He then planted the explosives and before they could detonate, he climbed aboard a Strog ship and blasted off towards another area. Now inside the freighter, he needed to reprogram the vessel's flight controls to force it to navigate to Stragos' moon. He tried to reprogram the ship's flight path, but it seemed to fail, so he headed towards the next best thing, an escape pod. The soldier fought his way to the escape pod, jumped in, then hit the flight controls. The ship blasted off and eventually landed on the Strog moon. Once on the natural satellite, he moved to disable a mining operation underneath its surface. He did so promptly, causing the cavern around him to violently rumble and shake. He then made his way through an emergency exit and into another building. Once outside, he battled his way to a straw tank, defeated it, and was then transported to an unknown planet adjacent to the alien's homeworld. After a long and arduous battle of fighting across the surface of the planet, he'd eventually make his way beneath its crust. Deep beneath its surface was the Strog Command, and it was filled with deadly traps. After dodging the extremely treacherous machinery located in the planet's core, the Marine found himself standing before a tank commander, but before he could attack it, the mechanized monster teleported away. Without thinking, he stepped into the gateway it had used to evade him, and he reappeared in a new area. He walked forward until the room opened up into a sizable arena, and two deadly tank commanders began firing at him. The Marine ducked, weaved, and shot at them over and over until they perished. Right as they fell, two hidden compartments opened, revealing two Strahd carriers, each intent on making the soldier drown in a pool of his own blood. Like the tank commanders before them, though, they were nothing against the lone man. After an ungodly amount of bullets, they were both slain. The guardians of the Strahd planet's core had been defeated, and with their fall came his victory. Did this destroy the entire planet? Did this eliminate the Strahd entirely? I have no idea, because once the guardians are killed, the game just abruptly ends. Whew, okay, that's it. Creating this video was an absolutely monumental task, so if you enjoyed it, please show me support by subscribing and leaving a comment. Here's to hoping that id is working on a new Quake game to continue the saga and further explore the narrative established in Call of the Machine. All right, that's all I've got. Thanks for watching. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go play some Quake.